Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the Academy District 20 Board of Education. Um, I want to welcome the 19 or 20 folks that we have joining us live as well. And um, this meeting is now called to order. Roll call, please. Ms. Cloninger? Here. Mr. Lavalley? Here. Mr. Lundberg? Here. Ms. Reynolds? Here. Mr. Temby? Here. Thank you, board. The Pledge of Allegiance this evening will be led by Mr. Lavalley. Please rise and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic, stands one nation under God, visible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Lavalley. We're moving on to agenda item two, the approval of the agenda. Ms. Matson, are there any updates to the agenda? Yes, and the board was notified of these updates. Thank you, Ms. Matson. Members of the board, are there any items you wish to move from the consent agenda? Seeing and hearing none, are there any items to be added to the agenda? And seeing none, I would like to add that in deference to guest presenters, please consider moving item 9A, Summer School and Summer Learning Opportunities 2021, prior to 7A, which is the ENDS 1.2 character. And that's approval. May we have a motion to approve the agenda, please? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Lundberg? Aye. Mrs. Reynolds? Aye. Mr. Temby? Aye. Thank you. We're going to move on to agenda item three, and that's the board quote, and that's mine tonight. And I am quoting Aristotle, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. And I picked that quote tonight because I think it ties really well to the E1.1 report we have on character education and speaks to how important that is to us as a district. And I think it also speaks to the work that the district is doing with social emotional learning as we try to support our students and families. And we see that in parent academies and other curricular areas as well. So that's why I picked that tonight. Aristotle said some good things. Um, I'm going to move on to um, public uh, comments. Mrs. Cortez, do we have anyone signed up to speak to the board this evening? Mrs. Cortez is on her way. That's OK. We went fast. <laughs> of course. Thank you, Mrs. Cortez. At this time, we welcome any members of the public who would like to address the board to do so. The board welcomes the comments of our community members, but to ensure that everyone will have an opportunity to participate, we have ground rules. In the interest of respecting the time of all who are present, speakers are to limit their remarks to three minutes or less. All speakers will be notified of the remaining time via the mounted monitors behind the dais. When the time has ended, the microphone will turn off Supplemental written materials can be given to Mr. Leibowitz, who's seated in the hallway outside of the boardroom, and he will deliver them to the board secretary. We greatly value all comments from the public, but in order to adhere to board policy and accomplish the work already on the agenda, the board will not respond this evening. Okay, and let's hold for one second. I think we have a tech issue that Mr. Sacolini is working on. The delay is that we have ASL interpreters with us and they're not really hooked in right at this time. So Mr. Sackley is working on that.
So we still have a timer up that says that we will, um, uh, if that's the timer for public comments. Thank you, we think we're ready to go. So Mr. Sackley indicates that our ASL interpreters are now online. That's what we were delayed for. And I am going to defer to Mrs. Cortez. Our first speaker is Mr. Wade Kennedy. Good evening, Mr. Kennedy. So what brought me here this evening is some of my concerns about the uh, the stories I see in the news from our, our east and west coast about the, the radical left woke culture that seems to be capturing so much of our nation. I've been in uh, District 20 here for 37 years, raised two kids, uh, all in D20. Started on the uh, first year with uh, TCA, the, the founding year. They uh, were graduates of uh, TCA and uh, Air Academy, respectfully. Uh, had excellent traditional education, was very happy. Uh, the last graduate was 2011, so I've been away from District 20 for a little while in terms of paying attention to what's going on in school. But uh, I want to make sure that District 20 is trying to resist some of the uh, changes in curriculum that are changing across the country that are uh, overcoming a lot of schools. I want to make sure that District 20 isn't working on teaching revisionist history like the 1619 project or critical race theory or social justice, uh, confer concerned with leftist teacher political views that uh, may be entering classrooms. Uh, I want to make sure that we're teaching our kids pride in their nation and in their country, their founding fathers, their founding documents. I know that we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee I heard about because I sat through the meeting uh, two weeks ago. And uh, frequently this can be Trojan horses for liberal extremists. You know, I'm, I was encouraged last meeting that one of the board members was, uh, was surprised and uh, alarmed that currently male members could use girls restrooms. So I said that was a good start because a lot of people aren't concerned about that. Uh, other things such as uh, in other parts of the country, drag queen story hour, do we have that here? Or are we otherwise trying to promote gender dysphoria where it doesn't need to be? And, and to change the subject slightly, if we wind up with a lot of Central American immigrant kids who don't speak English, maybe even speak Mayan, um, maybe older, 15 or 16, but have only so far passed through sixth grade at home at best, how are we gonna be able to handle that without, without really disturbing Thank you for your comments, Mr. Kennedy. Your time is up, but we do appreciate your comments and we understand your message. Okay. Um, no, we do not. We, um, as, as I read, we don't respond to public comments in the public setting session so we can get on with our agenda, but you will get a response from me by email. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you for your time. Our next and final speaker is Carrie Fox. Hello, Ms. Fox, welcome back. Hello, thanks for having me again. Uh, so, you can start the timer. Last time I spoke, um, I was worried about um, the number of 
COVID positive cases reported in our district and our district dash dashboard showed 425. Um, today that number is 603 and those are positive cases. Um, the wastewater data for our, our district on um, the 29th doubled um, from the last time I was here. Um, I'm expecting a spike. <laughs> and today, the El Paso County Public Health showed uh, the seven day incidence rate up 20% from the last seven days. And I'm just concerned about getting rid of the recommendations that the CDC has in place for um, smaller cohorts, especially at the middle school level where kids cannot be vaccinated yet. Um, my personal class, I have 26 kids in there. Um, 700 and something square feet. It's it's hard and it's crowded and it's less than three feet apart. Um, El Paso County Public Health data dashboard shows 24.64% of all outbreaks in our county are in K through 12 schools. Seven of the 17 of those are here in our district. 42 individuals affected active cases as of this week um, reported yesterday. Um, I would like to know if there's a threshold other than sub availability that would bump us back to following those CDC guidelines um, because I feel like it's important. Our student safety is important. Our staff safety is important. Um, and I did send you a copy of those guidelines at the last time I was here because they had just changed on Valentine's Day. Um, with uh, the mask mandate going away uh, April 3rd for adults, it's still going to be in effect in schools is my understanding. Um, I just, I feel like we really need to think about it and lay out uh, stronger safety guidelines for staff and for students. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fox. Thank you for your time again. <clears throat> Moving on from public comments board, um, we'll move to board comments. And I would like to begin with, I didn't tell Colonel Johnson, so he stepped out for a second. He'll come. <laughs> Let's start with Mrs. Cloninger. Good evening. <clears throat> Um, I don't have much to report today because of being away on spring break and things like that. And by the way, I actually did get to get away <laughs> with one of my children. I was able to go home for a minute um, for the first time in a long time. So um, I appreciate the warnings of not jumping back in with two feet and and being ambivalent to the virus. But I also can appreciate maybe a light at the end of the tunnel and some reprieve from what has been a horrendous year and a half or so. So um, I look forward to getting back into the schools and I've been in touch with several of my principals that I've of my school liaison um, and I uh, look forward to being there with the kids. So that's all. Thank you, Ms. Conager. Glad you got to go back home. How about Mr. Timby? Uh, also not much. Um, did have the uh, opportunity to sit through a CASB uh, organized uh, virtual session with Congressman Lamborn uh, and uh, Mr. Lundberg and Ms. Thompson were on that call. It was good to get an update uh, from Washington and Ms. Thompson did a nice job representing our district talking about IDEA. And I'm looking forward to the NASB conference, albeit virtual for the second year in a row. It would be nice to actually attend one. <laughs> Um, in person at some point, but uh, looking forward to that. And uh, actually starting to look forward to uh, what uh, graduation holds here for us in another uh, month and a half, month and three quarters, uh, as my daughter will be graduating soon. So looking forward to that. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Timmy. Mr. Lavalley. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Um, I hope everyone had a good relaxing spring break. I see some people look tanned and rested here. Um, which is a good thing. Uh, I, I, um, I'm just glad that uh, everybody's back in school. I'm glad secondary is back to four days per week. 
I look forward to us being five days a week soon. I'm glad that that kids are back in class. It's a, it's always a good thing, and um, just glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lavalley. Mr. Lumberg. Thank you. Um, I had the pleasure of also, like Mr. Temby, attending uh, a few of the the legislative conferences put on by CASB as a virtual uh, a Zoom type meeting. They're very interesting, uh, and I do appreciate CASB's work on that. That's very good. I actually got to go to high school. Well, of course I would go on a Wednesday. I forgot. There's no kids at school. And I walk in and it's quiet as, oh, geez, oh, Pete. So disappointed, so disappointed. I should have gone today to the high school. Nonetheless, it was nice to be in a school, finally. <laughs> Other than that, everything is going well. I'm a pleasure to be here and uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Lumberg. Colonel Johnson. Nothing to add, thank you. Thank you, Colonel Johnson. Uh, just a few comments for me. Um, first, I wanna uh, thank you to Mr. Timbery and Mr. Lumberg for attending some of the CASB advocacy sessions with our representatives and, and uh, senators. I was unable to attend those. I know they're always good. I like them better in person, but I hear they went quite well. And I hear Mr. Temby that you too represented us well um, from Ms. Thompson, so thank you. Um, also looking forward to the NASB conference. Unfortunately, I won't be able to attend on Friday, but I will be there on Saturday and Sunday, well, virtually, right? Um, but otherwise, I'm looking forward to that. There's always good learning there as well. And I want to thank District 20 leadership for something. I guess I've never really done this before, but as I was um, grading papers for my school finance and law class at UCCS, I don't, I can't count, and I'm not going to use names because I'll forget somebody, that the number of times that leadership in this district's names came up as um, mentors or people who offered their time to talk to them about law and finance and how they felt so much better about the district because of our leaders and its principals and its it's our finance folks and it's it's just great to see so while we don't and that's been going on even before i started teaching those classes i know that so it's just another example of how we reach out in the community to help uh, build our new leaders that might be coming forward so thank you to all of them you'll be hearing from me individually as well um, and i just need to welcome miss Matson for being here tonight for the very first time and i know the pressure is heavy and but you don't need to worry about us we'll take care of you uh, but thank you for being here, Ms. Smith. It's good to have you with us as well. And I'm going to move on to administrative comments. Mr. Gregory. Yes, Ms. Matson, so far so good. <laughs> uh, Dr. Smith, please. Good evening. So I have the pleasure of sharing the probably most anticipated announcement of the year. Uh, this has been an unusual uh, year for sure and one that's required lots of flexibility and patience by everyone. But I'm pleased to share that the last day of school for all students will be May 21st, 2021. The regularly scheduled teacher work day and professional learning day will be on Monday, May 24th and Tuesday, May 25th. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Always an important announcement. Uh, usually, <laughs> if you look back at prior years, it doesn't happen this early. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will follow up with one thing on that announcement. If we were to have, since we've announced the last day, uh, if we were to have snow, uh, we will probably be in school. Uh, so that we can't, or we can't now move the date back any further. So, uh, but we have the ability to do that now, and and it's a matter of. Uh, I won't say easy transition, but it is a matter of easier transition. So I do have a few other announcements. Uh, the newest addition to our district is coming to life. Recently, uh, the planning cadre for, for, a companies, for Encompass Heights Elementary School toured the construction site, and we're happy to see the walls standing. The cafeteria, library, and dyslexia therapy room and some classrooms now have ceilings, windows, and paint. Before we know it, we'll be holding the grand opening ceremony. Explorer Elementary School found a way to get students out of the classrooms for field trips by using virtual reality goggles. The students uh, toured parts of South America, 
I'm not sure if they were tanned, Mr. Lavalley, but they toured South America, explored animal habitats, and learned about ecosystems across the world, all while sitting in their library. These field trips, quote unquote field trips, uh, have caught the eye of KRDO Channel 13. You can watch a feature story about these virtual field trips tomorrow evening. Alyssa Darland, a second grader at Chinook Trail Elementary School, won the Silver Award at the Colorado Parent Teacher Association Reflections Art Contest. Alyssa is one of three students in her category to win the award. Her essay entitled, I Matter Because, is dot, 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 is now moving to the national competition. Congratulations to Alyssa. Craig Brinkman, a senior at Rampart High School, is the 2021 winner of the Pikes Peak Philharmonic Youth Concerto Competition. In the 21 years of this competition, Craig is only the second saxophonist, did I say that right? Uh, saxophonist uh, to win. Because of the pandemic, he won't be able to play with the Philharmonic this year, but he will still receive a scholarship for his award. Ella Anderson, a junior at Discovery Canyon Campus High School, is the winner of an all expense paid trip to the week-long Colorado Youth Tour Leadership Trip this summer. She penned a short essay for the Mountain View Electric Association's yearly contest explaining a cooperative business model and why leadership is important. Her story was featured, uh, her story was featured Colorado Country in Colorado Country Life magazine. And lastly, certainly not least, our very own, and this may kind of connect to what Ms. Reynolds had commented on, uh, lastly, but certainly not least, our very own Becky Allen, Chief Financial Officer, and Tanya Thompson, General Counsel, are offering their expertise at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, Ethics for Educator events in April. Ms. Allen will share her knowledge on ethics in school finance on April 13th, and Ms. Thompson will explain ethics in school law on April 20th. So congratulations and thank you to both of them. Uh, that's all I have, Ms. Reynolds. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to tell Dr. Smith that seemed a little anticlimactic this year, didn't it? Every year, everybody waits for that May 1st announcement, but uh, so the electronic thing is paying off in some ways. Um, I also um, wanted to add that piece about Tanya and, and Ms. Th Ms. Thompson and Ms. Allen. Um, yes, it's a part of the grant, the Daniels Fund grant, um, where they want people to do presentations about ethics, and so um, they're actually going to do that in my class, but we're offering that across this across university. So who knows who's going to show up? Wish me luck. I'm sure they'll do great, but I'll figure out how to get them in there. Um, it's all virtual. It's all virtual. So here we go. Well, I just wanted to let everyone know that we have 34 attendees now um, on our live session as well. So um, thank you for being here and having an interest in what we're doing. All right, we're going to move on to a consent agenda. We need a motion to approve the following resolutions. 21521 approval of matters relating to administrative staff licensed. 21621 approval of matters relating to administrative staff classified. 21721 approval of matters relating to staff specialist staff. 21821 approval of matters relating to licensed staff teachers. 21921 approval of matters relating to licensed staff licensed support special services provider. 221 oops sorry excuse me 22021 to 2 2121, approval of resolutions for the non-renewal of the contract of probationary teachers. 22221, approval of matters relating to classified staff. 22321, approval of student fee schedule for 2122, and approval of the Board of Education regular meeting minutes for March 18, 2021. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Lundberg? Aye. Mrs. Reynolds? Aye. Mr. Temby? Aye. Thank you, Board. I practiced all those two 20s and, and I still messed it up. There's a lot of those. Um, so I'd like to move on to agenda item number six, please. Um, we didn't pull any items from the consent agenda, but we did move item 9A, Summer School and Summer Learning Opportunities 2021 to this spot. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Gregory. Yes, Dr. Dr. Field, please. And, and crew. It's all good, though. You guys coming in. 
Are we still good with if we it, present take off masks? Sure. Are you okay if we take ours? Oh off? yes, please. Everyone okay with that? Yes, please. All right. Yes. So I have a fabulous group of principals behind me. I'm going to introduce you. I know you all know them, but so Carrie Evans, our elementary principal, Dan Olson from Air Academy High School, and Brett Smith from Timberview Middle School. And Carrie is principal at Ranch Creek. I, I left out that one, small one detail. Thing, Dr. Field. Yeah. Why these three principals? Um, these are the three fabulous folks who uh, sit on cabinet this year. So they get the uh, they get the volunteer duty of uh, helping present uh, as needed uh, at times throughout the year. So thank you three for being here tonight. And Joe Royer is here also. He is just online. He's in Arizona. And so he is going to chime in. Are you there, Joe? Yes, ma'am. We are so good at this. Is we this unbelievable really or what? Really good at it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next slide, please. So this evening, we want to share with you, board, what we are working on for district programming this summer. I know you've heard a lot of talk about it, and we want to share with you what our plans are to date. And I'm going to talk uh, first about, uh, or actually Joe is going to talk first about just our regular summer school program that we have that goes on. And then I'm going to share with you our um, new District 20 reading summer clinic and we're going to talk about special ed preschool and then each of the three principals are going to share what is going on at each of the levels elementary middle and high school as they've been working really hard on that so next slide please and i'm going to let joe go thank you dr field good evening board i will take you through the three different levels of uh, summer school that we are currently working on and uh, with the assistance of the ESSERT funds, we have been able to reduce tuition at all levels uh, to help kids with the learning loss, the social emotional needs, and also kids that are looking to advance and get ahead that maybe didn't have that opportunity during the school year. Um, at the high school level, we normally charge 250 tuition. Uh, this year we will charge $40 per class. And if a family is still qualifies for a free and reduce, that, that rate would also be reduced accordingly. Um, we will have an in-person option and we will have an online option. Our sites are at Pine Creek in June, Pine Creek in July. We will have four classes being offered in person, being biology, PE, language arts, and Spanish, both June and July. And then we also have 20 teachers teaching multiple subjects online through the Accelerate program like we uh, like we did last year. Um, so it's our goal to be able to service and provide services for 620 kids in June and 620 kids in July. Uh, I call them enrollments. So we have 1,200 enrollments online, 160 in person. And the reason why I call them enrollments because one student could take a class in June, in July, so he would be or she would be responsible for two enrollments. So we have almost 1,400 seats for high school kids to enroll. Uh, enrollment will start on the 19th with the reduced tuition. I would anticipate the seats go fast. Counselors have been notified. We've worked with principals and uh, we are excited to be a complimentary set of services with what's going on at the uh, site level. At the elementary, in person, we have seven teachers teaching over at Academy Expl uh, Explorer, so we can have 140 enrollees. We normally charge $140 for tuition. Tuition for elementary will be $30 this year. And so those 140 slots will go quick, but we're excited to have those teachers with us. And we also have 100 slots in July, five teachers, uh, where we will be over at Academy uh, international offering the courses. Um, our in-person is not as high as normal because a lot of staff that would normally work for us during summer school are now providing services at the individual sites uh, with a more uh, district site uh, program offering. At the middle school, we have two outdoor ed offerings, uh, hiking the hills and geocaching. We uh, have traditionally charge kids $140 for those classes. Uh, we are offering them for $20, and that includes transportation costs. 
So we know those seats will go quickly. And then something we're probably really excited about, and I give all the credit to the band staff in District 20, is uh, we will be offering a, in July only, uh, a pretty extensive beginning band camp for students. We have 10 to 12 band uh, staff from high school, middle school, elementary working together where we can service about 400 to 475 students that are all beginners. Uh, because if one reflects back on what took place the last, I'm going to say 18 months, if you were a beginning band student in the district, uh, you've yet to have an opportunity to put your hands on the instrument and blow uh, because classes have been, you know, obviously moved online and kids weren't getting the instruction. So the band staff came together and we sat down and talked about how we could service the kids. And so we're going to we're going to service about 50 kids per hour. And normally we charge $80 a student for a 45 minute class. Uh, this year we're going to do an hour class for $15. And that also includes purchasing the band book for the individual students. So excited about that. And somebody would say what happened to the advanced or intermediate student? We will offer a concert band for one hour and take 100, and 100 plus students in the individual instrument sections and offer that for intermediate and advanced. So uh, excited, possibly over 2,000 enrollments that we, we could offer with kids. Um, I, I think we could do more, but uh, uh, our staff were being pulled in all different directions, especially working at their own sites. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you have for me at this time. Anybody have questions for Mr. Royer before we move on? I, go ahead, Mr. Royer. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. Royer. Um, I, I don't mean to sound critical at all, and, and, and I, I want to, I'm thinking in terms of if, if a parent were to hear this and he might or she might say, with all the things that have gone on with our school curriculum and, and remote learning and all that, we're offering geocaching. How would you respond to that? Well, I, I would respond because we had to write it into the Esther grant. It's a great question, Mr. Lavelle, is, you know, a, a lot of kids in the middle school were not able to do their after school events, not go on their outdoor ed trip to the Grand Tetons, not have their traditional uh, club gatherings. And so these two, to me, are ways for kids to get back into socializing with their staff, going on field trips, interacting with other peers across the district, not just their peers in their quad area or their core area. Uh, so we saw uh, we saw the outside uh, class as, as being one, a safer one. We're outside, we're exercising with kids, trying to, you know, get them working with peers. And uh, so I would say more of the social and emotional uh, on that, working with kids would be a very strong positive for the middle schooler. Thank you. Um, that, that's, a, that's a great answer. I have one last question. This is most for the audience too. We all understand ESSER. Could, could you all define ESSER so the 36 people know what we're talking about when we talk about ESSER. Yeah, if you're, if you're okay, Mr. Lavelle, I would turn that over to uh, Ms. Ms. Allen or, or Mr. Gregory. Probably a good answer. So I don't know exactly what all the, is it elementary, secondary, something, recovery? Yeah, we call There's, it COVID, federal COVID money. Right, federal COVID money that came through Congress. And that and this is with the second installment of money because the first installment came about a year ago. Thank you. You bet. Mrs. Cloninger. Um, <clears throat> my one question, and I, I've been a parent who's never taken advantage of, of uh, summer school with my kids, um, but I do know that some people use it for more than just, you know, for, for a place for their kiddos to go and things like that, not just the learning opportunity. That's a bonus, I think, sometimes. Um, but I worry about the burnout of going straight from, especially this year of going straight from the school year into another month or so of school, which I'm sure you've thought about. But um, so to that end, I feel like the geocaching, I could make a geocaching lesson plan right now in my head because I've done a lot <laughs> of that with my boys. But um, but I do feel like, I mean, what are your thoughts on the on the burnout factor. I know that the teachers that are doing it are volunteer, that they're not being told to teach or something like that, but um, I'm sure I, I don't share everybody's feelings about it. I just wondered what your thoughts were about that. 
Sure. Um, you know, I've worked closely with the high school principals, so I kind of know what they're offering to help and assist kids. But I, I will tell you our, our phones and our emails are busy. So I know there's certainly genuine interest uh, in taking these classes for a number of reasons. Um, we have a lot, not a lot, but I would say we have 30 to 40 kids that are looking to get advanced so they can be in a different math track. So this is a very important resource for them and parents. And we also have a number of kids that need to make up credit so they can walk that stage and uh, we, we assist them. You know, one, one component that we have added the last two years is we've hired two counselors and they work closely with parents and we'll connect them with resources throughout the district, including IEP, special ed, to, to make sure that these kids are successful. We, we had a great run last year and uh, we had a 98% success rate. Uh, I'm not sure it's gonna be that high this year because of what you just mentioned, fatigue, but uh, I do believe we have a need and I believe all these classes will fill up quickly because of the price and also because of the need for kids. I appreciate that answer. I guess for me, and <laughs> I'm taking this too far, but uh, was just how would I propose or how would I pose that to a child who is feeling fatigued? You know, I know the parent is seeing the need, the phone calls are going on. How do you propose that so to a child who's feeling fatigued? Is this, a, is this a personal on? counseling session? Mr. Yes, Conjure? I would like to okay. um, pay well, you all. <laughs> well, I, I will give you my final answer. One thing we find, and I interview all the kids uh, going through summer school, and we do a survey and one thing we find is that kids are not fatigued as much in summer because they can do other things and only focus on one class. They're only allowed to take one class. So we have a lot of kids work, still take the class, only have one teacher, one set of expectations, one set of grades. So we find kids really like it. And uh, it makes me think about the block schedule at CC where kids are, you know, they're intense, but they're only doing one class. And so a lot of the kids say they really like it. They can only do one class, get through it, no problem, versus taking five or six and having six teachers, six different expectations, six policies. It, it is it is fatiguing for kids. But we find that one student, one class, one student works quite well in June and July. Thank you. I'll put your check in the mail. <laughs> Thank you. M Mr. Lundberg. There's another way to look at summer school sites, classic uh, biology, algebra one, at summer enrichment and, and kids kids can find that uh, they can have fun just doing normal things such as geocaching uh, and that's not bad because that's an enrichment thing for the children so besides the classic teaching that goes on it's okay to also have classes that uh, are considered what i consider summer enrichment classes thank you mr lumberg um, I just want to add that um, I'm really glad to hear about band. I work, I live, <laughs> work, I live with a band director who <laughs> kept saying all year, how do kids ever learn instruments if they can't start playing the instrument this year? What's going to happen? He's like, I think lost sleep over it or something. I don't know. So I will be happy to go home this evening and tell him that we have this great beginning band idea and we have advanced students who get to play as well this summer. And that just made my night, Mr. Royer. Thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. Um, I would also say that um, I was going to ask you when registration looks like, and we won't know till mid-April, so hopefully you'll keep us informed because I think this sounds great. Anybody else want to add anything to Mr. Royer before Dr. Field continues? Did, Mr. Gerke, did you have a comment you wanted to make? I, I was only going to comment to Ms. Cloninger's question. But, you know, these aren't all summer, and if you look at, you know, there's July offerings, so if a student is feeling like you suggest they could have the month of June off, uh, and then make the decision at that point whether they wanted to take a summer class or not, or if they wanted to, you know, do it early and get it over with, then they'd have the the last part of the summer. So there, there's options in there for. Uh, it's not like you're committing the entire summer, and as Mr. Royer says, you're certainly not committing every day, all day either. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. Dr. Field. Okay. Thank you. Next slide, please. So this summer we are going to sponsor a district elementary summer reading clinic. And like I have said to you many times that if students are not reading on grade level as they progress through the grades, um, that's why we have achievement gaps, right? So we at the district level under our leadership of uh, Miss Andy Ruskin, our director for literacy, are developing 
a summer reading clinic, and we're going to offer two three-week sessions as well. And there will be one in June for the most of June, like June 7th through the 24th, and then there will be a three-week session in July, July 12th through 29th. And this is 100% online. And this is also one-on-one -on -one instruction that will be provided for students. We have some parents and families in some of our schools that only want online option this summer. And then of our 20 elementary schools, we have six that um, are not going to be doing a summer reading program at their school. They have, they if, if students in their school need additional reading support, it'll be through our district program. And um, Carrie's going to talk a little bit more about what each of the different schools um, are doing because everyone's doing something a little bit different. Some schools are going to wait until the end of July, beginning of August to do some summer, what we call jump start work, and others are going to continue right after school gets out in May. But we are uh, very focused on this program. We're using a new curriculum called 95% Group, and it's kind of a, uh, it, it's, it's sponsored by the READ Act or approved by the READ Act, and it is a, it's chunked into 25 one-hour lessons, and then you can extend beyond that. So our students that are not reading on grade level that need extra support are going to get a very structured literacy approach to learning how to read or just building on the skills that they need to build on and where they're starting from. Hiring for this starts next week. So Andy's going to be looking at uh, hiring teachers. Our teachers will make $36.90 an hour. So, and that will start next week. And this is really for K-3 students. Uh, we have a lot of students that need the support in K-3. That's their focus area. If there are extra seats, they would do students for grades four and five. So that is Summer Reading Clinic. This is something also, this is different from our dyslexia support. So we, this week, just to let you know, decided that we are going to call our dyslexia center the D20 Dyslexia Support Center. And this is a, that's a separate um, group center that's going to support students with dyslexia and their families. That will also be working this summer. So we have a lot of teachers that are in our cohort. Remember, we I think I told you, Jenny, and I told you a couple months ago that they have to do 750 hours with students one-on-one -on -one just to get that certification. That'll be going on this summer as well. And we're looking this fall to start after school tutoring for students with dyslexia because we want to start that regional um, after school tutoring center and, and it will help us get certified to be a regional training center. But this idea around a, <clears throat> excuse me, a district summer reading clinic will continue to grow as well. We already, Joe already offered summer reading through a curriculum called Spire every summer in summer school, but we're going to give this 95% group curriculum a chance this summer and continue to build on this as well. So we would have summer support for students with dyslexia and then summer support in reading for students that are just behind. So that's summer reading clinic. Do you all have any questions about that? Okay, next slide, please. Uh, hold on. Sorry, Mr. Temby appears to ask as Mr. LaValle. Um, we know that um, one of the superintendent's initiatives was to look at learning gaps and other issues. Does this tie in directly uh, as a tactical piece of that? I wouldn't say that it's it's a result of the initiative. Uh, it's more of a result of the environment we've been in, but there certainly be, could be connection to it and support for the initiative. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Mr. Mr. LaValle. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Um, I'm really excited. Maybe it isn't the right word. Um, it, this is great that we're doing this, though. And I, I spent the dyslexia thing really sounds great. Uh, my only question is, and this, and this set is somewhat of a, of a rhetorical question. I'm, I'm sure probably all the elementary teachers know of, of certain kids in their class that really need the summer reading. Is there any way that we're able to, to talk with them, not course isn't a good word encourage them to sign up or is it, is it purely first come first serve or how, how do we there'll be space that our biggest challenge will be we, we need to find enough teachers mm. because I think there's certainly enough students we just need to make sure we have enough teachers and so that's something that Andy will be working with principals closely and then we will have teachers reach out to families and say good you know, you can go all six weeks, and most of these kids will go six weeks. There's a little bit of a break there, but there might be some families that say, well, we were planning to be gone visiting family in July. Can we just come in June? Yes. Good. So, so we, you're, you're targeting 
it's not just whoever wants to do this, but hopefully we're, we're targeting, if maybe that's a good word, those that are that we're inviting have students. Inviting. That's a the great, great. Yep. I, I figured that. I just didn't know. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Dr. Peel, go ahead. Okay, next slide, please. Dr. Peel, if I, did you talk about cost at all? Did I miss that? There's no cost. That's what I want. That's what I wanted to make sure was communicated. That just, was a setup question. Just the class to pay the teachers for their time. But no cost for students. Correct. Yeah, that's great. Is that for the reading clinic and the dyslexia yes. center? Yes, because remember our teachers, yeah. that those and we're starting our third cohort this summer. They all have to have 750 hours. So it's part of that. It's part of their training. Cool. So it's a win-win. It's awesome. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, so special ed. So every summer we do special ed. Every summer we do extended school year. And extended school year, students are identified for extended school year through the IEP process. So case managers with teachers make decisions right around this time of year whether a student would benefit from our extended school year. So that is not anything new. Um, this is something that we've done every summer and you can see the locations on the slide. Jumpstart is new and Jumpstart started last summer with the first round of CARES Act or ESSER, I don't remember, stimulus money that we got from Congress. We started this last summer and you can see it runs the last week of July, the first week of August and it, it is just that. It is a jumpstart to get students with disabilities back into a routine, back into learning, doing some pre-learning ahead of school. And that's what Jumpstart is all about. And they're still looking for a location for that. And that is 100% ESSER funded. That one is. Mental health support, that's also ESSER funded. And this mental health support, I'm going to talk about a different one in a minute, is for students that have IEPs and have goals in the area of mental health. So students would will be able to receive support continue um, through the summer and you can see the dates there July I'm sorry June 7th through the 21st and then July 12th through the 30th and that will be here at the EAC we did some summer counseling last summer that was sponsored or funded through ESSER dollars but this is different this is for students with mental health goals on their IEPs what we are going to start this summer hopefully um, is we're going to open a a counseling center and we are going to use ESSER funds for that as well and my goal is that this summer we have three counselors and a social worker hired and this will be counseling for D20 students that need mental health support or counseling that perhaps need wraparound services and that's why a social worker will be available to support families as well because families often need additional um, services and support based on their family needs we are going to use the old Journey K-8 modular over at Endeavor. If you remember, it's a beautiful double wide. It's actually our, our nicest modular we have in our <laughs> district. And um, we're going to actually, I'm going to go walk it tomorrow with some of the facilities folks. It is nice. It is two, ba two bathrooms. That's like <laughs> even better. And it's virtually brand new. Journey K-8 was there, what, two years maybe? That's so nice. it is a really nice um, double wide but anyways we are going to be there wait there's one office there now I need to have two or three three additional offices built we'll have a reception area this is something that we know our schools need we we have a need to support mental health in our community like never before and so um, we want to be ready when our kids uh, need support and I'm super excited about this and I can give you more details about that later. And then finally on this slide is our partnership with Colorado Springs Park and Rec and we've done this for years as well. When I was over at Woodman as principal, we, I used to host it there and this is for our students that are our most severe needs. So our students that are in SSN programs and you can see the dates and locations there. That is um, something that we've always done. Next slide, please. Dr. Field, can we interrupt with a oh, question? Oh, sure. Mr. Timmy. Yeah. Just a quick question on uh, Jumpstart. Um, given the individual needs of kids, is faculty and uh, uh, people to facilitate that an issue for us also? It can be. Yeah. Um, Belinda did a lot of begging last summer. We, we were able to pull it off last summer. But I think also, you know, it was a new program, a new idea. 
And so they have developed a new program and idea and know how to support students and how to set it up. So I'm, I'm hopeful that they'll be able to hire staff as well. But and it's our, and it's our special ed staff. Good. Okay. So preschool is also an offering this summer. Typically we do a preschool session here at the EAC and it's at High Plains this summer because we are getting, what are we getting? We're getting a new, we're getting something new here the last week of June and the double, first week of July. A new double white. <laughs> a, new, a new double white. What are, what are we getting, Tom, this summer? It is, um, it's all the, it's the wiring, it's the, Gen the power, all yes, all of that. Why we went down a few years ago. Remember when we had the board oh, okay. meeting in the dark? Okay, not okay. Yes, with lanterns. Yes. Okay. I, I, I'm lost on the next year. Mr. Mr. Smith will be, on, be able to answer that question, but uh, it's it's okay, you know. switches the, the the whole other than main power. It's yeah infrastructure. How about we That's do good, that? Yes. So we'll all be working from home the last week of June, the first week of July here at the EAC. But this preschool program is, is normally always offered here at the Briargate Preschool, but that's why it will be over at um, High Plains, and this is not an ESSER-funded program. So next slide, please. And then finally, uh, before Carrie goes on, um, a lot of our funding sources, not all, but a lot of our funding sources it is the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Act. We do have some leftover ESSER-1 funds, and we, um, which I think probably Brett and Dan and Carrie are going to talk about some tutoring that's going on right now for students, and we're using some of that money from ESSER-1 to pay teachers after school to do tutoring of students that need support right now, and then ESSER-2 is new funding that we're going to do summer programming with. So I'm going to let them talk. Thank you, Dr. Field. Could we have the next slide, please? Hi, everybody. Thank you for allowing me the time to just talk a little bit about what the elementary school principals are planning for the summer. You have learned all about what the district will be offering, and we are just really working to have a layered approach to meet the needs of our students. We know that this was a really difficult year, and we just want to have a plan in place to be able to serve as many students as we can. And so you heard about the district online program that students will have access to. If parents feel comfortable in having their students remain in person, then each of the elementary schools, and you'll hear about the secondary schools as well, will be offering summer programs for our students as well. Each of the schools is um, creating this based on the needs of their individual students. And so um, we will have June sessions and July sessions. Some schools will be doing one, um, some schools will be doing either, um, but the majority of focus is going to be all around reading and really capturing those students who we know have those academic learning losses that we want to try and close that gap before they come back for the following school year. Um, the idea behind all of this is this will be, like I said, in person, small group instruction. It will be very focused. Um, each of the schools are identifying the needs of the students and individual families will be contacted and invited and hopefully um, will be inclined to attend because we know this is what the students need. And so these will be short sessions, and so students will still be able to enjoy their summers. Most of the sessions are running about an hour to an hour 15 minutes, depending on the curriculum resources that the teachers will be using. Um, we want to um, use those with fidelity. And so we are planning our sessions around um, the resources that we are choosing to use. And so what we know as principals is this really is just the start of a long process um, because we know that we do have academic um, loss, we know we have the social and emotional loss. And so this is just the first step to what we know will be a multi-year process for us in, in capturing our kids. Are there any questions at the elementary level? Ms. Connors. Um, does that mean you said it's at every single site? It is not at every single site. It's at the sites that you've said on here or that you've put. Are they? They're not listed here. Um, there are 14 of the 20 sites this summer. And the one thing that I was wondering is, do the principals have to be there at the schools for, I, I didn't know how it works with when you have that many 
kiddos coming in there if you have to have admin in there There have too. to be an admin on site that can be in a principal assistant principal we also mm -hmm. have teachers with their admin license oh, okay. um, so some of us are utilizing them as well this summer okay mm -hmm. but thanks for thinking of us yeah <laughs> <laughs> are all yes all funded with ESSER funds mm -hmm. thank you so no no cost to students again right which is important seeing no more questions okay thank, thank you, you for your time All right, next slide, please. So, uh, as Carrie said, thank you for inviting us here so we can answer some of your questions. I think that uh, we are all doing the same thing a little bit differently in meeting the needs of students. So I will speak for the middle level students and things that are going on right now. This is all ESSER one funded for what's going on between now and the end of the school year. and. We put the proposals in through learning services and we are all in some way doing tutoring. Think of that as after school or before school tutoring that teachers are running that runs anywhere from an hour to maybe 90 minutes, which pretty much fits a, a class time or a block schedule that, that kids are used to. This began on the 15th. Well, wait a minute. That was Snowmageddon. So it began on the 16th of March. For most of us that coincided with the start of the fourth quarter and we're going to do it through the fourth quarter. There are a little bit differences. Some schools have teachers teaching an overage and have created a class that can address kids who can't be there after school or there's transportation concerns or, or parent constraints on that. Um, and so we're trying to meet the needs of all of our kids. We all use some means of data to determine the kids we want to target for this. So what we've had this year is the use of NWEA data that talked about a fall and a winter gain or a loss. And that was the baseline that we set to get kids. We communicated with parents and then we had parents uh, um, have their kids in for, for that at whatever the time is that we've scheduled it. Teachers are paid $36.90 an hour to do this and most of us have that it's on a rotation so teachers sign up when it works for a schedule no teacher is doing it four days a week one might have just Tuesdays because that's what works for them to to do that we are all planning for something for after school in the summer as well most of us are are running in conjunction with what our high schools are doing so for me I'm trying to follow the Liberty extended school year calendar that they're going to run. I know DCC is trying to run as a common campus, but we're trying to run the same type of tutoring, um, structured, targeted math and English language arts for about three weeks after the end of the school year. But at the middle level, most of our kids have missed out on a number of things this year, sports, clubs, activities, real elective classes in the way that they were doing it. Our hope was that we would be loosing some of the requirements and the restrictions. So we were going to balance math and ELA classes with things like, dare I say it, Miss Reynolds, band, um, and getting kids to learn that the clarinet end, I understand the big end is the front part of it and the little end is the one that you blow into. Um, we want to offer PE. We want to offer some experiential activities. Um, one of my teachers is the outdoor ed and geocaching person. And so we want we want to offer kids a balance of there's an extension, make it fun to come and then target that reading or that math deficiency that is there. And we are all looking at something um, for the beginning of the year. All of us have done things with our incoming sixth grade classes that we're unable to do the way we've done it before this year. We can't have them in the school. We can't have them mixing cohorts and being with teachers and other kids and having those things done. So part of the great stuff that happened last year out of the SPED program where they created this jumpstart program, one of my teachers worked on that and brought that back and said, why can't we do that on a bigger scale to bring in our kids that we will know at that time are coming, our choice kids, our feeder elementaries that come into that. Now, of course, I did want to call it boot camp. I was voted down on that. Um, apparently, that didn't go over well. So we, we are working on, on something to say that it's a jumpstart type of program. We will reach out to our incoming kiddos to do that and focus on them, and it'll be voluntary, no cost to any kid 
The same with the extended school year. We're going to reach out and talk with parents. We're going to open that up for parent choice on that to come in. No cost to kids, at, at least at, at Timberview and my senses for the rest of the middle schools, we're not really having a problem of getting teachers to volunteer. None of them will volunteer for the whole three weeks. It's it's what they can commit to it and be focused on it and we'll create teams then and they will work together. So um, we are very concerned with the social emotional piece of this though in getting kids back into something. I, again, for Randy's benefit, <laughs> we started bringing our eighth grade band kids together now on Wednesday mornings mm -hmm. before the late start starts and we keep them in cohorts and getting them in front of an instrument again and working with Liberty That's High great. School. So. We can get them down. I know other middle schools are doing similar things there because we are all concerned with with band. Yep. Questions? Any comments? For, OK, I am because I know you have something. I'm sure. Go ahead. Did you say how many people you had in your like how many spots or is it just kind of however many I, sign up? So we our goal would be to keep the academic classes even in tutoring right now at a one to 10 ratio. OK, and we have all of our SPED teachers who take the resource kids and they work in a in a push in and a pull out model that works with that really consistent what they're doing now. I would anticipate that the summer we would try and keep the same thing, but we haven't made the offer yet. So gotcha. I would think that parents who have found the tutoring process very successful and they say, oh, there's going to be some more fun things that will offset just, you know, how do I get my kid to go in for math? Well, it's because you get to do geocaching too, or, mm -hmm. or you get to you get to play flag football because we're going to be able to do that. Then then we would have people signing up for it. I think we will be able to meet. All of our needs at, at my school and, and looking at it with staff and, and what would sign up with mm -hmm. that. But I, I don't know the, all the rest of schools and I don't think any of us have a roster for the summer. Part. Sure. Just yet. OK. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. LaValle. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, just a quick question. So what we're doing, what you're doing now that started, I guess, this is the second week, I guess, you're yes. doing it at the point court. It's, so it sounds like it's mostly tutoring. Is it, do you, again, do you say, hey, Johnny or Susie, we, we really think this would be good for you. Talk to the parents. Um, and, and is it any of the classes that are offered or is it just, math and in reading how does it work right now so we're focused on math and ela right now the okay. the th the gaps that we know that currently exist that fit within the curriculum for the pacing guide that is there so much of this has been happening all year long with a number of math and ela teachers they they already do tutoring and things like that and kids are already there what we have found when we've brought all kids back to school all kids don't care that the bell rings at 245. Here's my problem at Timberview is I have more kids who want to stay at the school and be around other people and be doing things mm. that looks normal. It's really a good problem yeah, to have. Problem. The great thing is, is the ESSER funds, ESSER 1 right now, ESSER 2 for the summer, is going to allow for us to compensate teachers for the same time that they have given up already for most of the year in addressing this and targeting kids um, that we that we want to address very specifically and get them just ingrained to come back into school and be in there for the four days a week. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. All right, next slide, please. Uh, before I get started, I was I was teasing Mr. Smith earlier. You know, now we only have to go to board meetings once in a while. Next year, he's got to be here every time. <laughs> so <laughs> we were giving him a hard time about that. So at at, <laughs> at, at the high school level, um, we are doing much of the same things uh, as our elementary and middle colleagues, but it, it shifts. The focus shifts a little bit when you get into the high school, and that's because of graduation requirements and credits. And so that's where where our main focus is going to lie, and that is trying to get those students that have struggled for whatever reason um, to get those credits so that they can graduate on time. And we're doing it a little differently at different campuses because as always in a site-based district, the needs of each campus vary a little bit, but we are all doing things currently, and then we are all planning on doing things over the summer. So some of the things that are going on at the high school level right now, as Mr. Smith said, with our S or one dollars, we're all doing tutoring of some sort, either after school, before school, 
um, paying teachers on Saturdays to do this work. But then obviously we're all also doing um, our Wednesdays, which is part of that schedule. We don't pay teachers double to do that on Wednesday. They don't get paid to do their regular job on Wednesdays, but we do pay them extra to do that tutoring work before school, after school, and on Saturdays. And it looks a little different. We have two different um, tutoring processes going on at the high schools. One is for the students that are in the, the classes right now. So if a student is taking, let's say, Algebra 1 right now and is struggling a little bit, they can sign up with a tutor to get help with their current work, get caught up in the current semester. But we're also addressing some of the learning loss from the semester before. So if a student struggled for a semester and had some gaps, then they can go back and relearn those. And our teachers are then going back and modifying the grades. And if a student achieves at a certain level, then they can raise um, those grades and give that credit back. Something we've never done before, but it's something that we felt we really needed to do. Um, another component that is happening at Rampart High School, I know that uh, Mr. Alvarez is actually running almost a complete summer, or excuse me, a night school at Rampart High School. He's the only one of us that was brave enough to undertake that, so kudos to him. But I know it's very successful as well. So, so that is what's going on right now with those ESSER $1 at the high school level. Um, over the summer, we are all going to have an extended school year beginning um, right the, that first day uh, that, that students are out that will run through June 11th. There will be a one week carryover between our programs and Mr. Royer's summer school programs, but we don't feel that will be an issue and we'll be able to work it out so kids can participate in both if they want. The, the big difference between students that sign up for our classes at their home schools and what Joe is doing in summer school is that is a complete course. So if a student has to take Algebra 1 completely over again, they would sign up for summer school with Joe. What we're doing is we are um, doing that learning recovery. If a student has already taken Algebra 1 but struggled and just needs to fill in those gaps, then they would sign up at their home school to fill in those gaps to complete that course and to get their credit for what they started this semester. That's the big difference. That's what we're doing at our home sites. And then we also have our online students that are in the Accelerate program at the different high schools that we will need to uh, accommodate as well. And so we're going to extend the time to complete those courses through those three weeks and allow those students an opportunity if they've been struggling with those. The, the classes that we're doing at our sites we, we want those in person. You know, we, we make a joke, but it's really not a laughing matter. But one of the reasons why our kids have struggled is because they've been online. Why would we want to do these, you know, tutoring programs and credit recovery programs online? We want our kids there. Now, if something happens and they have to, um, you know, to to stay at home, you know, we'll certainly work with that. But we are we are really encouraging our families to have their kids come um, to the campus to meet with those teachers, to meet with their peers, and to take care of that. Um, and, and to kind of, you know, answer some of the questions that you guys had for my colleagues, uh, this is totally optional. If, you know, if kids are, are stressed out and, and don't want to do this and want to retake the course the, the following school year, you know, that, that's up to them and the parents. You know, this is certainly not mandatory, but we are encouraging and we are reaching out individually to all students that we feel will benefit from that, either an administrator, a counselor, or a teacher have, have been reaching out to those kids to try to, and the families to try to encourage them to do this work. So we're excited about it. Um, it's, it's really something that, that some of us have talked about for years about, you know, the, the variable maybe shouldn't be time, the variable should be learning. So if we need a little more, more time to get the learning, why not? And that's what we're doing here. You know, we've taken that time out and we're going to concentrate on the learning and making sure that our students are prepared for um, for next year. And these dollars will continue into next year. And so we're looking at, you know, uh, doing some of these things, the tutoring and things like that uh, going into next school year as well. Uh, the social emotional, um, once again, that is that is it, it's it's a real thing. Our kids, they're, they're, they're hurting. They want to be around each other. They want to have those connections. And those are some of the things that we are going to address as well. So some of these dollars, these SR2 funds, 
I know at DCC campus, um, they do strength finders and they're going to be using some of their money to engage with their students on strength finders. Um, some of us are doing some um, some work with our Capturing Kids Hearts programs that, that bring those uh, social emotional needs forward to the kids. So a lot going on in that area as well. So um, those are the things that are going on at the high school level. So questions? Mr. Tempe. Uh, this is a question for the whole team. Um, first of all, thank goodness for the ESSER funds. Yeah, for sure. Um, but at some point that well runs dry and given the trauma that we've experienced in the past uh, 13 months, um, how do we see this moving forward? You know, obviously some we will we'll have offerings that are subsidized. Above now. my pay grade. Yeah, so, so we have offerings that are somewhat subsidized right now. So right. obviously they're more attractive, more accessible uh, financially for many of the families. So what does this look like in terms of a suite of things that we do two, right. three years down the road? Sustainability, right? Yeah, because it, it's important. Well, like Dan said, it's all about learning and some kids need more time to learn. And I think that our work that we've been doing around professional learning communities and just really putting systems and structures in place that support students and student learning so that nobody falls through the crack or through the cracks continue to support this type of work. So what Dan and um, Brett talked about with tutoring and getting extra help for kids or students during the day getting extra interventions during the day to catch up and to keep up so that they don't have to go to an extended summer school or go to summer school, yeah. right? Our summer reading will continue and we'll figure out a way to, I mean, we, we already were doing summer school, some summer reading in, through summer school, but we'll continue to grow that as well. So I think it's about really looking at our structures and how we teach and learn and how we let kids relearn. And the fact that, like I know my own son, who's a junior, will be in extended learning for math probably May 24th through June 11th. And that concept of instead of having to retake the entire class, he missed a month recently of school. He needs the, the those concepts and skills that were taught during that month. He doesn't need to retake the entire course. And so how do we do that and build that into school? That's what we need to talk about. And I think we've got some amazing principals that are already thinking like that. Yeah, but but the reality is it will create a, a little bit more of a hardship on each school in terms of um, compensating faculty uh, and also as a district, I think we need to look at this holistically and just make sure that support is for the site programming as well as the summer program. So, Agree. Yeah. Agree. So, Great work. So. Thank you, Mr. Lavalley. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. I just want to say, it, normally summer school is, is important, but it's um, it's not, if you will, crucial, perhaps. But but boy, this summer it really is. It takes uh, outsized importance, and and I'm very happy with what I've heard tonight and seen. Thank you. It's so important to to, to really help our kids. You know, we heard, I believe, it was a month ago, we looked at at the um, our our not test scores. What's what's the whatever that abbreviation was. NWEA. That one, Data. yes. Those are and, and, and we, yes, they are. You're Sorry. right, thank you. No, that's good. <laughs> but we saw the results and they and they weren't good. And, and I, I said, I think there, we will do everything we can as a district to get our kids back. And this is what exactly what we're doing. And so I'm very happy and pleased at what y'all are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lavalley. Mrs. Conninger and then Mr. Lundberg, please. <laughs> I think Dan was trying to preempt this <laughs> questioning. You might be in to come back. Well, it was about high school. <laughs> I was just going to say when you were talking about that, um, uh, uh, it's not in front of me. Yeah, thank you. Learning recovery. Mm -hmm. um, you're talking all classes. I mean, oh, you can't I'm, be I'm talking sorry. No. all classes. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I should have mentioned. So at the high school level, we are concentrating on, on courses that are, are needed to graduate. Okay. Um, just because we just don't have the staffing sure. to to deal with all of those. So um, the tutoring, we are tutoring for for everything. Sure. We, we have the funds to do that. But for the summer work, for example, in math, we're, we're concentrating on um, Algebra 1 and Geometry. Those are the two math classes that they need to graduate high school. English, we will have four years. Sure. Um, and then Science, we're going to be working on, you know, the, the courses in, in World Language and... and um, 
social studies that they need to graduate. Okay. That Thank you. Yeah, sense? I was. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I wasn't you, imagining that yep. you had that many <laughs> teachers wanting to be there. Though. No, and that's going to be the struggle, as as Mr. Royer said. You know, finding people to staff it. But you know, knock on wood, right now uh, we we have enough, you know, staff that have said they're they're willing to you know, to do it to to make this happen. Well, I just want to um, chime in with um, Mr. Temby about just a, a great job and and so grateful for these ESSER funds that we can be able to do this. I have a child over at Chinook Trail Middle School and it's almost like everybody's gone into a project based learning type situation, you know, because that's what that is in with Tom's um, curriculum is that if they miss this part, but they get it in third, you know, term, then they can they can you know meet that grade or whatever. And I I think teaching to that it might take away that whole stigma of teaching to a test, you know, because we're taking those pieces and and helping them get better at that. So anyway, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Lumberg. Don't sit down. <laughs> <laughs> The learning recovery is that mostly math or is that all subjects we're we're, use, we're going all subjects all subjects that our, uh, students need to graduate and that's the and and this is the essence of mastery learning basically correct okay that's exactly what it is good that was easy uh, so back in the 1990s i'm dating myself i know um, I was really into, into and I still believe in outcomes based instruction, which is what you're talking about. Um, the many, many times that we fail a student because they didn't get one concept and they have to retake an entire course is absurd to me, always has been. You've done my heart good tonight. I think it's important and we think about all those positive things that COVID can bring about, like not COVID perhaps, but the way that we look at the world differently. This might be one of those. Um, I was involved in winter school programs and summer school programs that allowed students to come in just to complete the outcomes that they hadn't mastered. So thank you. It didn't fly in the 1990s because people were suspect of what that was about. I think that we've learned a lot since then. So that's good news. It's really good news. And I just can't help think about the question that we get asked so often as educators. Well, what do you do with all your time off in the summer? So I just <laughs> thought I'd tell you that we have addressed that very well this evening. Dr. Field, thank you for your leadership and for all three of you for the leadership that you have in making this happen with your colleagues as well. Uh, Mr. Garvey. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Reynolds. A um, couple things and I, I'm going to take advantage of our short agenda tonight if you don't if you don't mind because uh, I'd like Ms. Allen to address maybe follow up a little bit on uh, Mr. Timby's question around sustainability um, from a financial perspective. I think um, be great. Thank you. And then First of all, you know, I, I can't speak highly enough and give credit to Dr. Field, Dr. Smith and Ms. Lang for leading the discussions through the principals meetings. But really, it was a presenting a problem or recognizing a problem. And these three folks, the principals uh, and all of their colleagues are really the they're the solutions generators, uh, the creativity. This was uh, all up to them. Um, they came up. There was an expectation, I guess I should say, that's, that folks did something uh, to, to recognize the, the issues, uh, but all of the solutions were created by principals at each level. That's why they're a little bit different from school to school. They're a little bit different, but that's what we're about, right? That's what defines us. Um, so thank you to these three folks, Dr. Field, Dr. Smith, Ms. Lang, uh, and certainly all the other principals and possibly teachers, uh, everybody else that was involved in uh, at the school level for coming up with these uh, solutions. It's a lot. I mean, there's, there's a lot happening this summer, certainly more so than any other summer. And then also to Mr. Royer, who, uh, you know, has a few wrenches that's been thrown into, he's now got competition, right, which he's never had before. So <laughs> we got a summer school program that's now, and I, and I say competition in a friendly way, but, uh, you know, we got stuff happening at all schools. Uh, and a summer school program that are all competing for uh, essentially the human resource that's involved uh, with teachers. So uh, the last thing I would say is uh, you've heard ESSER 1 referred to tonight. You've heard ESSER 2 referred to tonight. Um, there's now an ESSER 3. Um, that's also the, the latest, I can't remember the number, XX trillion dollar federal package. Uh, created a, an ESSER 3 um, that we've uh, 
it's still at the very beginning stages of defining, but what I do know so far is that there's more flexibility with it, uh, which is good news. Uh, so what we will try to do our best with that is one, uh, support student needs, but also two, can we get a, a, a long-term benefit from that one-time revenue or that one-time cost? So those are things we'll be looking at also, but to get at Mr. Timby's question about, okay, this is great for this summer, but what about next summer or the summer after that? If Ms. Allen, I've given her a warning that I was going to ask, so if she could speak to a little <laughs> bit about what what's did we did we spend it all uh, the summer or have we reserved from some Ms. Allen for uh, the future? And I'll let can Ms. I Allen invite these four fine people to sit if you'd like, um, or leave. I don't or care. Leave. I'm not going to tell them what to do, but because they're your folks. But you know, feel free comfortable to. Sure. Yes. So feel comfortable to do what's most important for you during this. I appreciate Mrs. Allen doing that. Why don't you guys have to stand there all night? Mr. Smith, did you have anything you wanted to say? I think. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Ms. Appreciate it. Uh, now. OK, um, all of us are trying to be creative with one time funds that we create a recurring resource that carries on long into the future and some of what has come out of the pandemic and the closure is it moved us into a synchronous or an asynchronous learning environment that now has become commonplace yes we're saturated with it this year we're tired of it we're tired of quarantines we're tired of hybrid we're tired of all that but in the future that that is truly the future and so we are all working on creating a resource by way of perhaps um think of it as a as a summer learning project textbook that is issued to kids. We print it from our own print shop. We we develop it now. We put it together and we use one time funds, but it's at a minimal cost to reproduce that summer after summer after summer to become something that's normative to help all kids. We're not talking about learning loss as a result of the pandemic. You're talking about kids that have gaps already to be able to do that. And, and there are a number of things that teachers have come up with to say, if I had this much money to do it, it only cost me this much money to keep it going for five or 10 years on this. So that is some of the good that has come out of ESSER. It's really not just the 36.90 an hour per teacher that we're gonna pay this summer. We are creating some sustainable and reusable resources that will carry on long into the future. So thank you for the ESSER funds wherever they came from, magic money. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Gregory. Yes. Ms. Allen, Ms. Are, you, are you there? Yes, I'm here. And good okay. thing that uh, you gave me the warning or else you know I would have been fumbling with the, the mute button. Can you hear me OK? Mr. Gregory, can you hear me? Yes, sorry, Ms. Allen. Okay, we can good. hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so great question about just how do the ESSER funds work and Really, more importantly, um, you know, within those constraints, how have we strategized our budgeting plan? So let's start with ESSER 2. ESSER 2 funds are good. We can expend them all the way through September of 2023. So many of the programs, the summer learning programs that uh, the panel did a great job sharing with you tonight, um, really span when the application was written. Uh, an example might be like that summer reading clinic or um, one of the other summer programs. It was actually written in three phases, a 2021 phase, so that goes through June this summer, a 21-22, which goes through July all the way till June of 2022, and then a fiscal year 22-23, where we talked about needs all the way out to July of 2022. So these summer learning opportunities are written in the application spanning multiple years. The good thing is as well is, you know, we do the best we can when we come up with our budget, right? It's just like when I bring the proposed budget to the board in May. We use our best educated guesses and we use the same technique as we developed all of these budgets. So we developed uh, budgets for all of the programs tonight. We did our best, 
but the chances of us predicting exactly the exact number of students who participate, they'll probably be a long shot. So the nice thing is that whatever funds we don't spend, maybe again, we use a, a conservative budgeting model. So the nice thing is any funds we don't spend this summer that we thought we would, we simply do a revised application to CDE, kind of an amendment to our application, and we're able to use those dollars for future years. Again, we'd have to be done by September 2023, but it gives us more flexibility as we think about strategizing all the way up until September 23. Now for ESSER 3, the ones that um, Mr. Gregory talked about that are literally, they're, they're hot off the presses. Um, today I had an office hours meeting with CDE. That was the first one. It is, it is truly hot off the presses. But one of the very good pieces about it, when Mr. Gregory talked about flexibility, ESSER 3 dollars, they can get into play for spending all the way through September 2024. So this gives us some nice time. Now, granted, we have to work on that application now and really get our, out our crystal balls. But again, if we're a little off the mark with our budgeting, we just we request of CDE to make some amendments. So we'll be watching these dollars carefully. We'll be watching the spending rates carefully. And if we need to make amendments to how our spending plans are, are looking based on actuals, we can do that with CDE's assistance and really have some longevity uh, for these funds. And as Mr. Gregory said, we're also looking for some expenses that take a one time dollar amount and really try to give us some leverage over making some purchases that will last multiple years. So that's kind of the overview. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. Thank you, Ms. Allen. So, uh, Mr. Tibby, that, you know, sustainability over 10 or 15 or 20 years may be an issue, but I, the point was, you know, it's not a one summer done. Uh, we'll extend it for as long as we can make it work and then possibly figure out how to, uh, as Mr. Smith mentioned, figure out ways that we could offer something similar at a, at a much lesser cost or something. Yeah, and that's a great explanation. And as uh, Dr. Field knows, uh, this is going to be fluid year to year to year. Um, we'll probably put inflection on different things each year as we determine how much of a learning loss there's been, the needs of individual kids, what happens with the site programming and how does that roll into summer programs. So, but having funding for that uh, is uh, heartening and uh, I appreciate Tom, the, uh, your foresightedness in looking at how can you leverage those dollars uh, for one time uh, expenditures, whatever, to, to amplify this program. So, um, but this is key. My biggest concern from this pandemic is, is how do you take the learning loss this year and bridge that over successive years? And some kids are going to matriculate out of our system. And what does that look like for the post-secondary institutions? You know, and, and the remedial training and what's, what's Pikes Peak Community College going to look like another year or two so the implications are huge uh, but I am glad that uh, uh, we're really uh, trying to leverage all this uh, ESSER funding but it is a big issue it's a big issue for the future here so so thank you. Mr. Lavelli I think you had something to say. I did thank you Ms. Reynolds so does CDE dole out the funds to us or does our does our district have x number of ESSER two dollars that we have to spend so it sounds like we have three summers to spend this are we sort of spending roughly a third now and a third next summer or is it we have to request to CDE we need money and, and if CDE runs out of the money before 2023 we're out of luck. How does that work? Yeah, the, Mr. Go ahead, go ahead, Ms. Allen. Uh, Mr. Lavalle, good question. So we get our, we know what the allocation is. So for CRF, the coronavirus relief fund, literally one day somebody said we have $10 million that came into the bank. So that's different. You sort of get the money, it shows up in your bank account, and you you make the the expenses, and then you're audited on the back end. With ESSER, we have specific allocations. However, we have to apply for the use of those funds. So the only way at this point, we pretty much know the dollars that we have. The reason I say pretty much know is occasionally we've gotten an extra email that says, well, you have a little bit extra supplemental funding that they gave out to all of the school districts. 
if I if I made a guess, perhaps two, three years from now, maybe there's some unspent funds and there's an opportunity to ask for maybe a little bit more funding. But mainly we know our amount up front. We go ahead and put in an application and, and it has to balance to the whole amount. So we're trying to forecast really how are we going to use these funds over multiple years. Um, and then, as I said, the nice thing is it's not in Sharpie, it's in pencil. So we can go back to CDE and say, you know what? Uh, we said we needed $500,000 for this program. Turns out we needed 420. We'd like to move the 80,000 over to something else. That's some of the flexibility that we have as long as we're looking at allowable expenses. Um, with your question about the budgeting over the three years, I would say we've put the majority into the, the first two years, and we, we certainly have um, some more as well for, for the ending, but we also know that, you know, again, there'll be some freed up funding just inevitably, and we'll be able to reallocate that as we need. And also we knew that we've got some S or three, uh, S or three dollars coming as well. So that's why we front loaded it and wanted to have, um, you know, Quite often, sometimes when there's a need, it feels like the biggest need and it has a sense of urgency that's very current. And so this sense of urgency is, is heavy right now. So we want to make sure that the resources are flowing properly right now. If we've overshot, we can use it a little bit later. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Makes sense. Mrs. Cloninger. Um, I wanted to make sure uh, that ESSER funds, and it's mostly because of kind of the buckets, going back to the buckets, but the ESSER funds can't be, I know that some of that, well, let me ask it this way. W when we were talking about some of the summer school and stuff like that, it's being paid for through ESSER funds. Are those $36 an hour to the different teachers? Uh, is that ESSER fund that's being used? So yes, Ms. Yes, ESSER Ms. funds Conninger, can, it is. So it is. Kids so they can be used towards salary or no? Is that because it would be reoccurring or can you explain to me why mm -hmm. that wouldn't go toward teacher salary? Well, existing it has, salary. It has to be Absolutely. connected to COVID. COVID. So yeah, you, you couldn't just, sorry, Ms. Allen, go ahead. I apologize. Uh, no, please, Mr. Gregory. It has to be connected to COVID. Uh, so SR1 had rules associated, SR2 has slightly different rules associated. SR3 will have slightly different rules yet associated with it. Um, so it ha one, it has to be connected to COVID. So we can't just give, you know, Something that would uh, a, a, year. Uh, a, a staff raise to everybody right. if we can't connect it directly to COVID, number one. And number two, your point about one-time funds being used in a recurring way, we, we wouldn't do that either. Uh, so that, that's a short answer to, to that question. We do it for the summer because you know it's an hourly wage it's there's no future commitment uh to it it's if you work five hours you get paid for five hours uh and there's no future commitment with that um the i should say too the amount is just to be clear this is not an amount an hourly wage that was created because it's not our money right this wage exists in our policy today uh because we could not we could get audited and and fail an audit because we created some fictitious wage because it was federal money. So the wage matches what we would pay if we didn't have federal dollars. Um, but that's, does that answer the question? Yeah, I, I think um, the biggest concern is for people that are listening and people that, are, you know, I don't know, are maybe unfamiliar with, I still call it the buckets slides, but, you know, just where those reoccurring pieces are. So I appreciate that. The other thing that I was going to say in a slightly different topic and bear with me, but I am thinking linkage in my head and I know this isn't necessarily the place, but I want to say it so that I don't forget. But that post-secondary piece, I, I was at home this past weekend and one of my aunts, I come from a long line of, of teachers and, and she works in, in a post-secondary um, place in, in LA and she said, I am wanting to get out of this level of teaching because of what's coming at me. So in to that end, I thought that would be a really interesting um, thing with whether it be linkage with the counselors that are doing the post-secondary, you know, readiness or whatever, 
or even bringing in some of our our local schools or you know Pikes Peak um, uh, you know UCCS different ones that would be able to speak to some of that anyway I was just something I was thinking of and I, I appreciate what Will was saying I think that that is where you're going to see kind of the longevity of some of these issues that have come up Mm -hmm. yeah, it's schools. been a number of years since we've had a linkage with university higher ed folks um, almost waiting a little bit to see how COVID impacts them sure. would be good too. But it's a great point. Ms. But Conger. we talked That's about kind of moving those back. Sure. And so I thought sure. maybe even toward yeah. next year or something that we mm -hmm. could kind of look into yeah. that because I think Absolutely. it makes sense. Anyway, something in the fall for sure. Yeah. Um, other comments or questions for either Ms. Allen, Dr. Field or Mr. Gregory? Thank you, Dr. Field, for a really good report. Thank you, Mr. Gregory, for adding that piece to answer the questions that our board had. So, yeah, yeah good questions, everyone. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to agenda item 7A. It appears that we still have 33 folks with us um, watching live. Agenda item 7A is the ENDS 1.2 character monitoring report. Mr. Gregory. Dr. Smith, please. It's still kind of long that walk. All right, situated here. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity Again. to share this year's ENDS 1.2 report character. Also, one of the much anticipated reports of the year. It'll be more um, exciting probably than the last day of school announcements. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I know that you had a chance to review the full ENDS 1.2 report, but tonight I'm going to highlight some specific noteworthy data related to compliance with E 1.2 character. For compliance with E 1.2, which states all students will develop the qualities of character necessary to be exemplary citizens and positive contributors to society, the minimum threshold of 70% of respondents in the student category and at least 70% of respondents in one of the two other categories, staff or parent will report that students consistently exhibit the identified character trait by selecting either agree or strongly agree. As mentioned in the report, we are in compliance with all 10 indicators and have exceeded the minimum threshold of 70% with all character traits and all respondent groups when referencing the district level data. And it's worth noting that trends for each indicator are very stable over time. As you're aware, the Character and Climate Survey provides us the opportunity to seek feedback from our stakeholders with respect to their perceptions about character and climate in our schools through a single survey instrument. Findings from the survey are also referenced when monitoring other policies like EL 2.3 treatment of staff. Next slide, please. That said, even though we use a single tool, the two focus areas, character and climate, are treated separately and they are set on their own five point Likert scale. Next slide, please. While the survey does address both character and climate, the ENDS 1.2 report focuses exclusively on character, which is central to this presentation. However, I am tentatively scheduled to present the climate survey results on May 20th. The data that we will review this evening was compiled and analyzed in partnership once again with Hanover Research. Please note that full survey for, the full survey for all respondent groups was included in the packet, as was a breakdown of participation rates by school. It's worth noting that TCA students, staff and parents were not included in the survey as they are implementing their own character and climate survey and those results will be included in their year end report. New Summit Charter Academy did participate once again this year. Additionally, as in years past, I've included qualitative stories from many of our schools. And while these are true stories that are specific to individual schools, they are representative of the many exceptional great things that are happening across the district. To give just a flavor of the anecdotal stories that were collected this year, I'll start by sharing that many submissions were related to overcoming adversity, fighting through isolation and anxiety, and learning to learn online, while providing support and offering empathy to one another during the pandemic. Regardless of the challenges that we have all faced this year, we recognized and celebrated efforts to raise money to fight cancer, students who were engaged in random acts of kindness, and some students who found their voices as leaders. 
We also celebrated student athletes who won state championships while also excelling in the classroom. We recognized a student who has persevered through an amputation to earn a full ride scholarship to the University of Wyoming to continue his passion for swimming. We celebrated staff who covered for each other during quarantines and we learned from our students who helped us to improve teaching and learning virtually and in a blended classroom. This was truly an exceptional year. I also wanted to remind you that the district and school level character and climate results will be shared with principals who will dialogue with their SACs, their PSSGs, and their staffs to discuss areas that might need further attention. So as we move into the PowerPoint, which I know everyone is excited about, and I am too, <laughs> um, I would like to point out that in response to requests and inquiries from staff and parents to see uh, data from all the levels, we will be looking at not just district level data, but also elementary, middle, and high school. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. All right, as we will note, participation was lower for this year's survey during the pandemic. Well, I was hopeful that we would see the same levels of participation that we've seen in the past. Uh, I do have empathy and totally understand why the, rate, the participation rate would be lower uh, for this year. For context, the survey window was open from October 2nd to November 20th. As you can see, the most impacted respondent group was among students who fell to 28% from 51%. One contributing factor, and I believe a large contributing factor, is the amount of engagement that teachers had with students during this time, the number of opportunities that could be afforded to students to take the survey while at school. In the past, it was common that teachers would provide time to take the survey during the school day. And this year, that just didn't happen the same way. Next slide, please. So the first trait we'll talk about is compassion. And the compassion, we have questions like, students assist others when they are struggling or need help. Students help others in need, even when an adult is not watching. Or students are active, thoughtful, engaged participants in the community as a whole. Next slide, please. As you will see, the character trait of compassion continues to receive among the highest percentages or most favorable perceptions of any other trait among all respondents. This type of close agreement is definitely not consistent across all traits. In fact, having total agreement in all uh, respondent groups is very unusual. Next slide, please. At the elementary level, there is near total agreement among all three respondent groups, and all three are above the district averages. Next slide, please. At the middle level, there is close agreement with the district-wide results, with the greatest difference being among middle school staff. On this slide, I ask that you note the red number. So I guess the number in the parentheses uh, below 86. I've noted in red throughout this presentation, whenever a respondent group falls more than five points below the district average. At the high school level. Yeah, I don't see Oh, that next slide, please. There we go. So the red number, yeah. At the high school level, students and parents responded similarly to the district averages with staff reporting lowest. So anytime we have a difference of five above or below the uh, district average, we'll see a green or a red number. Next slide, please. For the trait excellence, look at questions like students put forth their best effort in all of their classes. Students try hard to do their best work on every assignment and students regularly put forth only the minimum effort required. Next slide, please. When it comes to excellence, we start to see some variation among respondent groups. For this trait, we see parents and students reporting higher percentages than staff. After giving this some thought, I think the difference might be explained by the number of students each respondent group comes in contact with. If you think about parents, they're thinking really about their student, maybe their student's friends. If you think about the student, their perspective is based on who their friends are, their own experience. When we think about staff, they're thinking of all of the students they have in their class, as well as all of the students they see in their school. I think that might explain a little bit of the differences throughout this whole survey of the difference in respondent group perception. Next slide, please. On this slide, please note the green numbers, which represents a more favorable or positive response when compared to the reference group, or in this case, the district data. That said, elementary staff and students responded to questions about excellence more favorably than the district averages. Next slide, please. 
The middle level shows lower percentages among staff and parents when compared to the district data, as well as previous year's data, particularly among middle school parents. Could COVID play a role in parent perceptions of excellence? I think in this year, quite possibly, just in how students are performing and how they're taking on the work and the, the, how students are engaging in their day-to-day uh, -day work at school. Next slide, please. At the high school level, the biggest difference when compared to the district data is among staff, which has been consistent and lower year after year. Next slide, please. The next gear which you trade is citizenship. With questions like students participate in school initiatives, students are actively involved in clubs, athletics, and school activities, students attend important school assemblies, and students will volunteer to help a teacher with a project, even if it means taking extra time. Next slide, please. So this slide, I would ask that you note the consistency over time in all of the uh, respondent groups. However, this year, parents reported lowest across the respondent groups and scored lower than previous years. I do believe that this change is related to the pandemic as questions related to citizenship are about being involved and engaged in school, and truly that's different for this year. Next slide, please. At the elementary level, there is more positivity about citizenship than the district average. This could be in part because elementary students were in school more throughout the course of the year and were engaged throughout uh, in their classes throughout the year. Next slide, please. The middle level data is close to the district data, but with a fairly sharp decrease among parents. Next slide, please. At the high school level, perceptions are lower than the district averages, especially among parents and students. Both saw steep drops this year. Staff perceptions are fairly consistent over time, but looking at students and parents, we see that there is a difference in perception of engagement in school. Next slide, please. The next trait is respect, with questions like students treat all students with respect, students speak respectfully to teachers, students respect the space and privacy of others. Next slide, please. Respect is interesting as students and parents are nearly in total agreement at 97 and 98%, while the staff data is much lower at 87%. Next slide, please. We go back to elementary. We go. The elementary. Timer's up. <laughs> the elementary level. <laughs> the elementary level shows agreement with the district level data. Next slide, please. As does the middle level. Next slide, please and high school. You'll note the total agreement among students and parents and an increase of four percentage points among staff. Next slide, please. Hope. <laughs> we'll work on hope. <laughs> All right. Students are excited about the possibilities of their future. Students are confident in their ability to have a positive impact and students believe that they will be successful in the next level of their education or career. Next slide, please. <laughs> Hope, like compassion, is among the highest percentages of all traits by all respondent groups. Hope is also exceptional and the st staff repeatedly score higher than both students and parents. This year, parents and students are the same. Next slide, please. <laughs> all right. When compared to the district data, elementary students, parents, and staff reported more favorable perceptions about hope and have nearly total agreement by all respondent groups. Next slide, please. Middle school came in slightly lower than district averages, but maintains its consistency over time and still very high. Next slide, please. And you can see the averages for high school were similar to the middle level data and are not too far from the district level data as well. Next slide, please. Next trait is courage with questions like students are willing to try new things. Students are willing to walk away from a dangerous situation even if it means they'll face ridicule from peers and students volunteer to answer questions even if they're not completely sure of their answer. Next slide, please. 
Courage maintains its consistency with parents continuing to report more favorably than staff and students. But this year you will note a slight uptick in perceptions about courage among staff and students. We will see over time if these perceptions hold or if they're related to how folks were feeling earlier in the year during the pandemic. We did see some increases throughout all levels this year. Next slide, please. Students and staff at the elementary level continue to share more favorable results with a 4% Pitch point increase among staff. Next slide, please. And middle is consistent with the district averages with a slightly less optimistic result for the responding staff. I think it's worth noting that students responded much more favorably this year about questions related to courage when compared to previous years. I think it could be acknowledging just the challenge of this year and having to overcome those challenges. Next slide, please. Similarly, high schools High school appears to have a slightly lower average with students and staff than the district average, but maintains consistency over time. Next slide, please. Honesty. Students cheat on homework and tests. Students tell the truth when asked. Students do not skip school or classes. Next slide, please. Honesty continues to be an area where we see a vastly different perception between staff, parents, and students. Next slide. Elementary responded very similarly to the district average with a sharp increase among staff when compared to previous years. Next slide, please. At the middle level, it's a different story with staff scoring lower than in previous years as well as lower than the district average. In fact, among middle school and high school respondents, questions related to honesty, specifically around cheating, were the lowest in the history of the survey. Is this the result to learning virtually and at home? Is it related to the need to shift thinking about resources that are available to the online learner? Is it about oversight for students when learning at home? I think all of these are questions that you have to think about uh, when we look at the data and the changes this year. Next slide, please. As you see, the high school perception data e fell even further this year among staff. Again, I do believe this is the impact of the pandemic. That said, please note that while there is a vast difference between the district average and the high school data specific to staff, that data is relatively stable over time. Next slide, please. Next quote, uh, trait is responsibility. Students can be trusted to follow through on their promises. Students accept the consequences of their actions and students are responsible stewards of resources. Next slide, please. Responsibility has historically received high percentages from all respondent groups, especially among students and parents. However, staff perceptions about responsibility have improved over previous years and the gap between staff and the other two respondent groups has decreased. We'll be watching that over time, of course. Next slide, please. <coughs> At the elementary level, staff appear to be more optimistic than the district averages and are more closely aligned with students and parents. Next slide, please. At the middle level, we see close alignment to the district percentages with staff reporting uh, slightly lower. Next slide, please. And the high school data is consistent with previous years and outside of the staff percentages in close agreement with the district averages. Next slide, please. Integrity. Students will cheat and give the chance on a test or quiz. Students rarely follow the school rules, and even if they don't think the adults are watching, and students report bad behavior. Next slide, please. When it comes to integrity, we have historically seen each respondent group express some uniqueness through their perceptions. This year, there appears to be a closer alignment and more positive perception among all three groups when it comes to integrity at the district level. Next slide, please. At the elementary level, there is closer alignment and more favorable perceptions, especially among staff this year. Next slide, please. At the middle level, like honesty, there is a larger gap between staff and the student and parent respondent groups. Next slide, please. At the high school level, the data is consistent, but clearly lower than the district averages. Like with honesty, questions specific to cheating were all were at an all time low among uh, staff. Next slide, please. 
think is appropriate. The last character trait of this presentation is perseverance. <laughs> students welcome learning challenges. Students continue to try and solve new problems, even if the answer doesn't come easily, and students work hard in all classes. Next slide, please. Perceptions about perce per perseverance at the district level is consistent with slight increases among both students and staff. Next slide, please. The elementary report slightly higher than the district average and was reported as more favorable than in previous years for stu staff and students. Based on the anecdotal evidence shared earlier, I do believe that the pandemic did play a role in how staff reported perceptions of perseverance, much like courage. Next slide, please. While middle school staff expressed being a little less optimistic than the district average, as did parents. However, when compared to previous years, staff reported being more optimistic. Next slide, please. In the high school, dropping below the district averages with all three respondent groups, with a slight improvement over time, particularly among students. Next slide, please. Just a few summary thoughts. Overall, elementary students, parents, and staff have more favorable perceptions about all of the traits than do their secondary counterparts. And both middle school and high school results are consistently similar, less optimistic than their elementary counterparts, with school, high school often being the lowest. Students had more favorable perceptions about themselves and their peers and than staff and parents with respect to the character traits, excellence, respect, responsibility, and perseverance. And students were in close agreement with their parents within two points, in fact, in the areas of compassion, excellence, respect, hope, responsibility, and citizenship. Both staff and parents had higher scores than students on questions related to citizenship. Next slide, please. Overall, the most positive character traits from parents, students, and staff were compassion and hope, which is consistent with last year. And parents have a higher opinion of students' courage, honesty, and integrity than do staff and students. Staff reported a le less optimistic responses than students and parents with, re with questions related to perseverance, integrity, integrity, responsibility, honesty, respect, and excellence. Next slide, please. What questions do you have for me? Mr. Timby. Thanks, Dr. Smith. You're welcome. Um, a observation and a question. Um, I thought the hope section was awesome. I, I expected mm. that to have been affected by the pandemic, and it really didn't show a change, and um, it was really replete with continued optimism about the future. And so I think that's great. Um, so that's the comment that the question slash observation under citizenship. I was really struck that the staff. Didn't really ding that year on year as much as the students and the parents. I mean, because obviously tangibly they couldn't be active in, right. uh, in activities, uh, extra, you know, whatever. Um, they, they really couldn't engage the school in the manner that they used to. And so they predictably ding that but the faculty didn't. And I just thought that was a, a strange anomaly. You would think that they'd say, well, yeah, my students can't do this, so they're, you know, they can't engage in citizenship. Right. So I was just struck by that. Uh, it was kind of an unusual uh, finding. So, so I'm not sure if there was a question there or just a, a, a be bewilderment there. So, it it yeah. is interesting, and obviously students and parents you know, identify that you know students aren't going to pep, pep rallies. They're not going to activities. They're not going to the same amount of activities that they normally would. Yeah. The staff didn't. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Conninger. Um, I just wanted to say that the um, the things in the report, which I did read every page of that long report, uh, but some of those stories were pretty endearing and. Um, is there a place that you post that so that families can see that? Because a lot of times I think that's the disconnect is that parents send their kids off and think, no, not my child. And that's clearly where we get our plus and minuses in that parent teacher 
ratio. And I just wonder, you know, because they get the one sided thing back, I, it would be nice for, I don't know, people to see some of those nice comments because I, I did think some of them were really wonderful. Thank you. And outside of the report that will be posted, uh, we don't have another place that we share that. But. <laughs> we should have one story a, a week. Right? If you could just get in like that auctioneer like you were in the summer. <laughs> Mr. Lundberg. <clears throat> no, before I read it, I, I wondered to myself what this school year would, this would show up as. And then I read it. Overall, I'm very impressed with it. Actually, there are some down bits, but I mean, there are more up bits than down bits. I mean, ignoring the point that that we don't have as many students taking this as we wanted, I thought the results were pretty good, especially for for the last school year. Holy smokes! So I, I'm, in that respect, I'm, I'm I'm very pleased. And this is. This is an important report for us. This is not a little minor right. thing. I mean, a lot of people would say, well, that's just a minor little report. Oh, no, 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 no. This is a big report for us besides the length. <laughs> yeah. But it is a it is an important report. So well done. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I was struck too by the uh, consistency that we've seen year after year, including this year. And even the, I think the grace that students and parents and staff have extended mm -hmm. in certain character traits in particular. Mr. Laval. I think Mr. Reynolds, Mr. Lumberg, you were looking at my notes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, when, uh, no, you answered that already. Uh, do we have any demographic data, um, you know, with ethnicities, male, female, that sort of thing? We actually don't collect that on this particular su survey. So yeah. location, um, you know, grade, that sort of thing, but we don't have uh, I know, I, I, I think about the DEI initiative and I think to myself, wow, wouldn't that be good to have this data broken yeah. down? I, I, and again, I'm, I don't want to, be out of place. Is that something perhaps does Hanover do that sort of thing? And is that would, would that violate? I don't think it would any any sort of uh, HIPAA, not HIPAA, uh, not FAFSA, FERPA. <laughs> one of those acronyms. It's one of those, yeah. One of those things. Well, I, I, I think it would be a self identification. So it'd be the only way to designate it is for it to be a question on the survey itself. But they self, yeah. So I don't think we would want to try to. Oh no, they yes, have at to parents sell. and no. you know, we don't have all that data. We may have student data, but it's it's kind of anonymous. It's supposed to be anonymously reported anyway. So there would have to be a in addition to the questions answer, something that identifies self identifies them, whatever demographic we would want to ask about. Yeah, I oh. mean, you know, what's your what is your ethnicity? Boom, 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 prefer not to answer. Or I, I don't know. Sure. I, again, I don't want to step well, out of turn, but it's it's a self selecting survey to begin with. So it'd be an interesting subset of that self-selecting. Well, and if you remember, and it's much smaller, but when we did our linkage, we asked students, we took it right off of here and asked those students that information. So DI group would have some of that, but it would be interesting. Um, you wonder if it's worth a conversation with Hanover to see what they think about the data set if we did that. Right. I don't know. I, I yeah. don't know what we think about that, but it's an interesting point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I can share that we have shared this information with the uh, CEI for the DEI effort and they uh, have used the data in some of their analysis. So good. Yeah, a couple other um, just a few comments. I want to run through fairly quickly. Um, like Mr. Lumber said, it is unfortunate, but I understand why the response rates were, were going to be <coughs> lower. Um, you know, when I when I was getting ready to read this, I thought, oh boy, what have COVID wrought? And, and like you said, I was pleasantly surprised. And then as I think about it, the, the integrity of our children shouldn't be based on, you know, if, if, if they have integrity, if external circumstances hit them, they should demonstrate integrity. And I and I and I was very pleased. Again, I, I was like, wow, these are really good numbers and, and I'm very, very pleased. You know, we have. Our global end statement is knowledge, skills and character, and we looked at knowledge and skills a couple months ago and, and, and our answer was we don't we don't know if, if we can say yes. But, but we can say yes to character, which is really a good news story for me. And I was very happy to see that 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 E our ends 1.2. We can say yes. Um, so that that was good. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, a couple of things. I, I, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I think 70% strongly agree, disagree. 
or strongly agree to agree is way too low of a bar for especially honesty and others. I, I just, I think uh, we're way above that. I, I just think that's, that's too low. Um, I'm, I'm not thrilled at the huge disparity between staff response rates. Very little you can do with parents. You, you can have some impact with kids, but it's tough. But with staff, I feel like you can have more. And, you know, I, I want to hats off to Academy Endeavor, 93% of their staff. And we have other elementary schools that were as low as 25% response rate for staff only. Uh, Chinook Trail Middle, good on them, 75%. We, we also had a middle school down to 32%. So I, I just would, that was my only comment. I, I just wish we could have higher response rates for staff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lavalli. <clears throat> and I would just add, I agree with you about, you, you read my notes. Um, so I agree <laughs> with you about response rates as well. It's always been a concern for me and there's gotta be a way that we can we can increase that. I don't know what that is right now, but maybe, maybe we could use ESSER funds. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I don't know, gift card, a drawing, if you-, you Gift if cards. You, yeah. But of course, the minute you do that, then you're giving away your uh, anonymity, aren't you? So, nevertheless, um, yeah, it would be it would be good to see more involved. I would also, <laughs> that's true. I would also just when when I was reading the comments, and I agree with all what all my colleagues have said as well. But when I was reading the comments, I had to, I found myself thinking about why they were very endearing. I was proud of teachers too, because as I look at what caused some of this, it was their content. It was their curriculum. It was the danger of a single story curriculum item. It, uh, those kinds of things are happening. So yes. not only is it happening just because kids are nice and have that integrity and things you're talking about, but teachers are promoting that, which yes. is the goal. So as Mr. Lindbergh said too, it's a it's a big e end for us. And so uh, teachers are there with it, I think for sure. And next year will be interesting because this was done again in the fall when maybe there was still more hope. <laughs> <laughs> that we would be moving along into a more normal year. So it'll be interesting to see if it changes at all next fall in, in any way, but maybe not. And I agree with uh, Mr. Lundberg when he talks about how, you know, there are kids and their integrity is, is there because of their families and things like that. And except for perhaps the one about hope. So I agree with Mr. Tempe on that one too. It's, it was good to see the hope still there. So anybody else have comments or questions before we move on? Um, thank you, Mr. or Dr. Smith, and I have an MRE here for us to respond to. Board, is the superintendent's interpretation of the policy reasonable? I'm seeing nods. Is there sufficient evidence to determine compliance for each section? And I would just, if I could, I meant to mention your comment, Mr. LaValle, about the 70%. I think if we get too close to that, we might want to look at that again, right? But while we're so high, um, it's helpful, but I, I hear what you're saying too, I know. It sounds like a C, doesn't it? Yeah, it sounds like a C grade. C yeah, C minus. Yeah, right, right. So, okay. Um, are there sections in compliance? Or, sorry, all, are all sections in compliance? Um, recognition of exemplary performance. Anybody want to make any comments beyond what you've already said? And maybe Ms. Matson can capture most of those. Yes. Yes. Will, you got to talk into the microphone. I'm sorry, I'm talking to Ms. Reynolds and he's not used to he's good. not used to being over there. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. OK, um, no, just kudos to the uh, individual schools for their uh, performances, particularly with their high participation rates. And um, I, I just my only comment is that parents are so important to this equation at every level mm -hmm. and um, uh, I, I know it's tough to get them engaged, but uh, kudos to the schools and uh, and the cultures in those schools where the parental participation rates were higher than kind of the average. So, um, but parents are the linchpin to what we do here. So uh, that's all. Thank you. And we'll add that to that, Ms. Matson, please. Concerns regarding performance. Nothing beyond what we've already mentioned about participation rates and things of that nature. Would you like to see additional or different evidence or formatting changes in the next monitoring report cycle? Uh, please again, Ms. Cloninger. I think just talking to Hanover yeah. about what we'd talked about. Yeah, the demographic. I demo. mean, that's if that's that a possibility. Thank you. Yes. Um, do you see evidence which is extraneous or no longer necessary? And that's a no. Are there any areas that would you would like to learn more about prior to presentation of the next monitoring report cycle? And that's a no. Are there linkage needs the board should address? 
And do you see the need for any part of this policy to be changed? And I have made a seating chart error of this. Thank you, board. A seating chart error tonight. I'm not going to put Ms. Connors or close to speaker. She heckles them continually. Um, otherwise, I think we're in a good place. Oh my goodness. Only, <laughs> only Dr. Smith. I don't know. All right, thank you, Dr. Smith. Very nicely done tonight. All right, we're going to move on to agenda 8A, GPA 4, GPA, GP 4.14, electronic attendance and participation in our school board meetings. Mr. Lundberg. Thank you. This is the first time we've ever done 4.14 because it was done last year. Just about a. That's one just, year ago. Yeah, literally That's one crazy. year ago. Yeah. So this, this is the first time. A virgin GP. Um, excuse me. Going on. Uh, this basically talks about uh, the electronic uh, Board of Education meetings and uh, executive sessions like that. There's nothing exceptional, exce exceptionally different on this. Uh, on page two, I'd like to at least point out uh, that number one on page two, board members may attend and participate by electronic means in regular special meetings of the Board of Education. And in, in number two, If we don't have a total electronic meeting, board members still may participate uh, when there are extenuating circumstances. And, and for instance, we had one uh, about uh, two or three months ago with Mr. LaValle. Maybe it was more than that. Oh, what was it, Mr. Temby? You're right, you were in Ireland or someplace like that or God knows where it was. I don't even know where I was. <laughs> well, and and it was with Mr. Lavalle as well with the illness. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. So, so this addresses those types of of situations. Um, the tenth point is an interesting board member who attends and participates by electronic means shall identify the location from from which he or she is participating. These are just common sense things. Number 11, the board member may attend and participate by electronic means a maximum of two board meetings within a 12 month period unless an emergency situation occurs. All the evidence is uh, through the Board of Education Secretary, Mrs. Matson. Uh, the evidence is the board of like Board of Education electronic meetings and agendas and minutes, the recordings of the Board of Education electronic meetings, and the board calls for the Board of Education electronic meetings. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is accurate as of 24th of March 2021, and uh, it should reflect that we are in compliance with uh, governance policy 4.14. Be happy to take any questions about this, especially being such a new one. Um, I would like, sorry to do this, I would like the board um, to maybe weigh in on number three. I just want to, because it, it needs to come through the board president as to whether there, there's approval for electronic attendance and or, you know, um, an excused absence, if you will. That's a different policy, but um, do, do we believe that extenuating circumstances is just what's listed there? Um, I'm not sure if a planned vacation or a trip that could not be de-conflicted with the board meeting wouldn't constitute if the board member can attend while on that vacation shouldn't be included yeah, potentially that's, in that. Thank meeting. you, Mr. Timmy. That's what I was wondering. Maybe a conference or something like that. So I want to make sure that we understand that that's at the case, or if it's not, then that person simply won't attend that night. Yeah, we've yeah. had board members not attend. Because I think job, kind of the paid part of our lives, um, for those of us who aren't retired, well, job, job is in Mr. There. Lundberg. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah, so job is included, but uh, yeah. certainly a conference commitment. Um, uh, and I would submit a vacation that just had to conform to an entire family schedule might be included in that. Yes, Mr. Lavelle. That's a great question. Thank you. Because I, I think it's reasonable mm -hmm. for us to miss 
I, I've always thought to myself, if I miss a board meeting a year or maybe two a year, I, I don't think that's an issue. I mean, if, I've, I've looked back and, and that happens. And, and I, I haven't, but I, I, I always reserve the right to do that sometime in the future um, if, if I have a vacation. But, but then I think to myself, but I, if I was somewhere, I would really like to, to be able to, to listen in electronically. And, and I, I, your point is, are we prohibited from doing so if we don't have a, a one of those things? I, I'd, I'd like to hear from you all. How will you feel about that? If you know, there, I don't have a problem with with us once once in a while going on a vacation. You're gone with your family and you can't make a meeting. It's happened. Um, does, does that mean we are prohibited from from attending that board meeting electronically? I, as far as I know, it's up to the president of the board. Is that how we interpret this? Do we want to? That's the way I interpret the whole thing. It's I up had to the, interpreted it as the board consensus, but I and not just through the president um, that it was kind of what we as a board decided about one person's absence. Well, about what that um, extenuating circumstance, something that I was reading in here made me think that it was kind of all of us that would, you know, kind of be OK or not OK. Yeah, but I, I, I don't have a problem with somebody calling in. I mean, if it were something that were a problem and it was consistently absent, I think that would be something that we would clue into. But if it's on the one off, yeah, I don't. Well, that attendance is problem. addressed um, as part of our policies. In yes, general. it is. Yeah, it's a different um, policy. Yeah, yeah. That's right. a different policy. So it would be up to the board to discern if that was problematic. Uh, somewhere um, in the. I, before, I do before, believe our discussion there's, about this. There's really, three that. Yeah, right. That are actually addressed in here. Yeah. And I do believe we, uh, as we discussed this initially, did agree that the board president discern what was an extenuating circumstance. Um, Mr. Lavalle, I'm trying to understand what the concern would be about somebody just plugging in and listening in um, if just logistics or whatever didn't allow them to just fully engage, vote, do things like that. I, I can't see what, what would preclude somebody from at least. Well, they can certainly go to a live session yeah. and watch. Yeah. Nothing would preclude that, but yeah, yeah. they wouldn't be able to vote right. and, and participate in the meeting. And I'm just, yeah. I, I I agree. I, I think it, I, I think it's reasonable to, to say it's, it's Mr. You know, the board president's call doesn't say that though in policy. Right. So I think where you're going is, do we right. want to say something in policy to say, to, 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 to codify that? Right, and I agree. I mean, I, I feel like that's something that we had talked about, and I remember what you're saying, Will, um, that we had talked about, but I mean, I, I get why we need to do it. I personally, I don't have any problem with with um, <clears throat> the way that we have it written. If we need to write down that it goes specifically through a board president, that's fine with me. Well, I, I frankly, mm -hmm. I don't. My my concern is the term family emergency. Um, I would I would think that we could just change one word to say family situation, right? Or family need. Or fa it, my concern is if I'm and I'm uh, approving it. GP four point four I believe it is. And Miss Tom Thompson, if you're out there, you can weigh in at any point in time too. But not required. Um, but I don't. I'm not. I'm uncomfortable as the board president saying, yeah. You're on vacation, and I think it fits the extenuating circumstances that you can join electronically and vote. Watch if you want to, or count it as an absent. That's all fine. That's all within policy. But I want to make sure that if I'm approving it, I'm approving the right thing, if that makes sense. So um, is Ms. Thompson even here? I hate to do this to you, Ms. Thompson, if you are. But... Hi, okay. Karen. I'm here. <laughs> so you have any thoughts? <laughs> uh, well, we, we did talk about this. Um, if you might recall last spring, we had conversation in terms of how many um, requests would be reasonable. Is it one request in, in a year? Is it two requests? And really, um, I recall the conversation turning back to the authority of and the discretion of the president. Um, so. I, I don't think that there's a right or wrong answer here. I think it's really how the board wants to hold one another accountable and who's going to be charged with making the final decision. 
Um, Isn't that why you there's get the your big board bucks? majority number eleven also, Ms. Cloninger. I'm sorry, Mr. Lumber. Isn't that why you get the big bucks, Mrs. Reynolds? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's why I, she I, set I, up. I have that. a stipend that you guys yeah. don't have. Ms. Um, Ms. Reynolds, I, yes. I think from a macro standpoint, our discussion concluded to Ms. Thompson's point. With this just really needs to be driven by common sense. Yeah. Sure. I agree. Uh, just needs to be driven by common sense. Yeah. And so uh, if we have policies that really so speak to uh, and to include this policy, uh, if a board member is not front and center and present in fulfilling their duties, you know, as a board, we address that. I don't, I don't disagree with you. Yeah. I but see. I also and, think I, that. And so I wouldn't want to get too rigid within this policy. I think what we're talking about is what constitutes really the excusable absence. Yeah, I'm actually trying to be less rigid than it is. Right. Yeah, that's what I was um, going to say. I yeah, think you're trying to open yeah. it up because yeah. as we have seen in days past uh, with the governing body of of the nation and the world, uh, that there's a lot of things that can happen. And so to open it more widely, I think is is smart. And I think if you wanted to take out a word so that it didn't say um, a family crisis or emergency. whatever. Emergency. Yeah, emergency. That um, that would be fine. I think that um, hopefully we continue to have good common sense on this board. I agree. And so I, I would like to make a suggestion that we change the word emergency, family emergency. It could just say, for purposes of this policy, extenuating circumstances means the board member's health, family need, job or military service. Do you see what I'm saying? Because, yeah. you know, if family a child is sick, is yeah, I'm not sure I'd call that an emergency, but it's definitely a family need, sure. right? So I just I don't want to get into the the semantics of defines emergency and somebody take us. I'm and good I'll, with that. So let me just throw this out: would a would a vacation that conflicts? I, I would think that would be a, a bit family need. I, I see so. that. And again, if you're doing that more than twice a year, we're gonna have another conversation, right? Right. Number eleven but, says, in fact, exactly twice. Right. A year, number eleven. You know, is, is, number so. eleven speaks to that. So. If you guys, or if you, the board is comfortable, if we can change that to need, and if Ms. Thompson is comfortable with that for any reason that I'm not seeing and feels like it's wrong, then I would like to just bring that back. It can be on consent, because um, we've been in compliance at this point in time, I believe, yeah. um, but just changing the policy language, and that can come back in that way in consent. But T it's two policies. Tina, Go ahead, do you Ms. have Robert. that? Good. So basically what's going to happen with this is we will vote on this as it is about whether we're in compliance and then we will bring forward the other policy in consent or the policy again in consent with that one word change next time for us to vote on. Is that fair? Fair. Good. Okay. Any questions, concerns, Mrs. Thompson or anybody else? No, but I'm glad you saved the best for last. That's what we <laughs> always do. That's what we always do. Okay, so I'm going to go to the MRE, this one. Is there sufficient evidence to determine compliance for each section? Yes, I think we've really been in compliance. Thank you, Mr. Lundberg, for that. Are all sections in compliance? And we never do the recognition of exemplary performance, except we made it through a year with a new policy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> concerns regarding performance? Would you like to see additional different evidence or formatting changes in the next monitoring report cycle? And that is just one new policy language change that we discussed this evening can help you with that, Ms. Matson, when it comes up if you need to. Do you see evidence which is extraneous or no longer necessary? No. And are there any areas you would like to learn more about prior to presentation of the next monitoring report? Any linkage needs? And do you see any need for part of this policy to be changed? And that is the, the word about family emergency becoming family need. Okay. And it's really definitional and it's vocabulary. I get it, but lessens the stricture a little bit. OK, right. we also have to trust you. If we can't trust you, we're in trouble. Right. Well, and then I have to trust all of you. <laughs> it's funny how that works. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for a good conversation. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so that was um, 8A. We're going to now move on to 9A, which is been done because we moved it up and we are moving on to a debrief for this evening. How are you doing, Miss Matson? How did it feel? You made it through. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did a nice job. Okay, was our a business this evening focused on activities 
that promote and honor our mission statement, our belief statements, and our global end statements. That reminds us that all students will have the knowledge, skills, and character necessary for successful transition to the next level and upon graduation be fully prepared for success. That's a yes. And I, before we adjourn, I also want to thank Mrs. Um, Kratchevic over here who came along to be support for Ms. Matson. And you guys are a great team. So thank you for being here. And this meeting is adjourned. Thank <laughs> you.